Our fourth contestant of the evening is Andrew McGee. Andrew is a researcher with the Moore Lab in the Department of Evolution and Ecology at the University of California, Davis. He works on phylogenetic methods and large-scale studies of the tree of life. So, I would like to talk about the adaptive value of disillusionment, or as I like to think of it, why it's so good that it hurts so much when your dreams get crushed. First off, dreams. Everyone's familiar with dreams, but let's get one thing clear. We don't mean the sort of dream that's really trippy that you tell your friend about the next day. We mean the sort of dream that makes you go out and do something, sort of an aspiration. Now, much like Lincoln here, you might associate some of the biggest dreamers in history with being some of the biggest figures. I'm here to tell you they were dumb. Now, dreams are bad. Dreams come with a whole range of selectively unfavored phenotypes. But on the other hand, I guess they make you feel nice sometimes. It's pretty clear a live dream is a very bad thing for you. Now, I say live dream because a dead dream is something quite different. When a dream dies, it gives you a chance to refocus on the evolutionarily important parts of your life. And in fact, a dead dream and the act of dream death is quite beneficial. And let's be clear, my hypothesis is that the only adaptive benefit of dreams is that it hurts like hell when they get crushed. <laughs> now, a problem. Dreams multiply. They go all over the place. We're all familiar with this. If we look at an example, someone who wants to be a scientist and she starts thinking evolution or ecology, good fields. She starts thinking about population genetics and phylogenetics and it just spirals. And if this looks like a phylogeny, that's because dreaming is indeed a branching process or at least you can model it as such, which means we get something like this. You'll note, the y-axis is logged. Dream accumulation is exponential. It just keeps going and going. And if one dream is bad, 500 dreams is a hell of a lot worse. So, what could save us? Dreams die. <laughs> dreams die all the time. It's perfectly normal. On the everyday, it looks something like this. Someone wants to help people, and she starts thinking maybe psychiatry, maybe psychology. And then one day she just decides, eh, fuck it, psychology. <laughs> it's normal. <laughs> but, and bear with me because this is going to get a little crazy, where things really get fun is with mass dream extinction events. <laughs> mass dream extinction events are like large extreme extinction events with a bonus. So let's take a look. Let's go back to our friend who wants to help people, and she starts thinking about being a doctor. And that comes with a whole range of doctor-like dreams. And then she pursues these dreams to college, like most people, to a biology major, and then she hits Ochem. Oh. <laughs> and she doesn't want to be a doctor anymore. No. Now, where it gets really interesting is that if the force of the trauma here, Ochem, is strong enough, this doesn't just wipe out wanting to be a doctor, this dream extinction event can cascade down through the tree. And indeed, it can leave her not wanting to help anybody at all. And this is really good. I mean, not for us, but it's good for her because dream death is really, really adaptive. Because when a dream dies, it hurts. The more dreams that die, the more it hurts. The more likely you are to go out and engage in sudden acts of fitness. And what you're also seeing here is that different people have different sensitivities to dream extinction, which is quite important. The people in the darker shades of red are quite fit. They are much more sensitive to the effect of dream extinction. Whereas the people in the lighter shades and the yellow, the research professors of the world, will continue to plot on and on and on. Now, let's talk about some evidence because this is science and I have evidence. First off, Let's talk about some of these great people that are quite dumb, in fact. Let's talk about Sun Tzu. We all know him. He wrote The Art of War. We don't know any of his children because he never had any. Joan of Arc. She saved France. She never saved her genetic material. <laughs> Alexander the, it turns out, wasn't so great at having children. <laughs> Alfred Nobel. He blew a lot of stuff up. Then he gave away a lot of money, but he forgot to give away his gametes. And then Mother Teresa, who it might shock you, but wasn't actually a mother. 
Now, clearly, these five people had way too many dreams and not enough mass dream sanctions in their life. But I think perhaps our best evidence is shown in this chart. This tracks the percentage of childless women by the amount of education they have. And I know, I know I've been talking about high school and college like this is dream crushing thing, but education is a dream shield. It's only in academia that you will find people spending two years trying to get two pages published in a journal they're never going to get near. <laughs> the real world, the real world is full of things that are good at making you refocus. It's full of bosses and taxes and bears and death and just a whole bunch of things that crush your dreams and they keep you fit. Hence, more children. Now, in summary, my hypothesis is that the only good thing about your dreams is that it hurts so much when they get crushed. Which is why I would like to thank everyone who tried to crush my dreams, because whether or not you knew it, you had my back. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>